everyone, this is Chris Grasso with the Healing Journey web series presented by Toivo by Advocacy Unlimited. My very special guest today is Jack Canfield, and I'll read you guys his bio, though I probably don't need to. I'm sure you're all familiar with him, but uh, it's really impressive, and uh, Jack's done a lot of great things in the world. So let me tell you a little bit about Jack before we jump into our conversation. You probably know Jack Canfield as the co-creator and co-author of the New York Times number one best-selling Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, which currently has 225 titles in the series and more than 500 million copies in print in 47 languages. He's also the founder and president of the Canfield Training Institute, which trains entrepreneurs, corporate leaders, managers, and sales professionals on how to accelerate the achievement of their personal, professional, and financial goals. Jack has personally helped hundreds of thousands of people on six different continents become multimillionaires, business leaders, best-selling authors, leading sales professionals, successful entrepreneurs, and world-class athletes, while at the same time creating balanced, fulfilling, and healthy lives. Jack is a dynamic speaker and was recently inducted into the National Speakers Association Speakers Hall of Fame. He has appeared on more than 100, or I'm sorry, 1,000 radio and television shows, including Oprah, Montel, Larry King Live, The Today Show, and two hour long PBS specials devoted exclusively to his work. Jack is one of the teachers featured in the recent hit movies The Secret, The Truth, and The Tapping Solution. Jack's best known success resources are the New York Times best selling book, The Tenth Anniversary of the Success Principles. How to Get from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be, The Power of Focus, The Aladdin Factor, and Jack Canfield's Key to Living the Law of Attraction. All of these resources consist of powerful strategies designed to empower and inspire individuals to achieving success. Jack's vision is to train one million people his, in his uh, success principles to pass on his legacy to others. He now has resources, live trainings, and online certif- certification course work available. Jack has been presenting these powerful principles and breakthrough strategies for 40 years to corporations, governments, and universities in more than 30 countries. Whew, Jack, that's a... Wow, that makes me want to retire after this. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me tired just, you know, I know, for you. I know, I know. shouldn't have had to read all that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, I think it's important to, uh, to honor the work that people are doing in the world. And, you know, I'm sure that's just even the tip of the iceberg of all you've done. So... Uh, I'm I'm glad, you know, to share that with listeners. Um, so thank you, first of all, for being on the show. It's a pleasure to have you today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, happy to. Um, so we're going to be talking today about this new book, The 30-Day Sobriety Solution, that you co-authored with a gentleman named Dave Andrews. Mm-hmm. And I would love to start out uh, talking about the family dynamic of the disease uh, of addiction. Now, some people I've talked to before we we came together uh, on this call, I told them, you know, I'm going to be speaking with Jack in an upcoming interview. And they're like, wow, interesting. What's his relation to addiction? And prior to reading this, I didn't know about some of the experiences you share about in which you talk about you had the angry alcoholic father, the mother who ended up crossing that line from abuse to dependence and aunt and grandmother, as well as two of your children. So it, even though you personally have not struggled with it, it is a family disease and, uh, and it impacts everyone involved. So I thought that would be a great place to start if you want to talk about your relationship with, sure. with addiction and the family dynamic. Well, it's really what got me to write this book yeah. was that I had grown up in a family, as you mentioned, my father was an angry drunk yeah. and um, you know, he had a difficult childhood and how he dealt with it because all the psychological skills that we have available to us today really weren't available to him. Yeah. He was in the Air Force and, and there was a drinking culture and when he drank, all that anger came up. And so I spent a lot of time hiding when I was a kid, sure. you know, it's in closets and other places I could find where when he was drinking, I wanted to escape getting hurt. Yeah. And also it developed in me something called hypervigilance where I'm always noticing every little clue is this going to be a dangerous night or not you know which has actually served me well in some ways I was a good point guard in basketball (laughs) you know whatever but at the same time you know it led to a lot of anxiety growing up and certainly into my adulthood where I had to work in therapy and meditation and other ways to overcome that Um, and you know I can remember my aunt and my mother were both alcoholics my grandmother was an alcoholic Um, I can remember being at my 
cousin's house and my aunt literally just passing out in the mashed potatoes, mm-hmm. you know, and my, my uncle picking her up, taking her upstairs, coming back, like nothing ever happened. No one ever talked about it, wow. you know, and, and she spent a lot of time in rehab. Uh, and so it just has always been part of the family reality. You know, yeah. unfortunately, it, if it's a gene, I didn't get it. Yeah. Um, but two of my kids did for sure. And I have a stepchild also mm-hmm. who just uh, recently came through recovery. So the reality is it's always been mm-hmm. around me. Yeah. And I was, uh, you know, affected by it in many ways. I mean, to see your children out of control, to see them, you know, endangering their lives, yeah. uh, everything from getting pregnant as a teenager to <laughs> getting a DUI, getting arrested, getting into fights, you know, all of that for me was very painful. So I basically, as a psychologist, which I was for many years, you know, I would apply the things I knew to these issues, but it ended up being, you know, AA meetings and rehab and all that. And and I'm grateful that those things were there. Yeah. But what I discovered along the way, when I go to AA meetings, I would always want to jump in and run an exercise that I know from the human potential moment, you know, from my work in right. running, you know, workshops, like you mentioned in the introduction. And I thought, God, if we could just do a guided visualization here, if I could just teach them this meditation technique, if I could just show them how they're still in their victim consciousness, you know, whatever. But of course, that's not what you do at an AA meeting. Right. And then I go to rehab and, you know, there are great rehabs and there are terrible rehabs. And so some of the ones that I took my kids to, I always wanted to like say, God, you guys you need some skills you don't have, you know, if they get, we could get through this a lot quicker. So always frustrated, always working with my own kids and they're all sober now and they're doing well. And mm-hmm. two of them are sponsors in AA and, you know, so they're all, they're all, it's all working. But I met Dave Andrews, my co-author at a conference. He was a writer's conference and he, he wanted to write a book about his coaching program called the 30 day sobriety solution. And he started telling me about it and it was based on a lot of my work, Tony Robbins's work, some other people's work. And I said, wow, how, how effective is this? He said, we get an 80% effectiveness rate. And I said, well, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> you get like 10 to 20 in AA and, and maybe, you know, People don't stick around. And then the younger kids today, none of them want to go to AA. A lot of them can't afford to lose their income and go to rehab. They don't have the money. So he was getting this ridiculous uh, result. And I said, this has to be made public. You know, you can't just be doing this for, you know, three or 400 people a year. Right. So I said, let's write a book together since a lot of it's my work anyway. We did that. We tested it as a book without the website, without the coaching. And we still got a 79.6% recovery rate. Incredible. And it still held, you know, months, 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 months and months later. So basically I said, we're on to something. Let's do it. So uh, we now have a companion website where we have guided visualizations. There's videos on how to tap to get right. rid of cravings and deal with your anxiety that shows up. So I feel like I'm very, very excited and literally – as you were calling in on Skype, I was hanging up the phone with another woman who's an addiction counselor, and she was saying, I'm so glad there's resources now. You know, there's yeah. all these tools that are, you know, we can use in our in our practice. So not only can it be used in the privacy of your own home, but you're if you're a counselor, a psychologist, a rehab counselor, or whatever, uh, there's now a lot of more tools available. Uh, you know, there are, and it's inspiring to me because as you're saying, there's good rehabs, there's bad rehabs. Mm-hmm. I'm no stranger to rehabs. You know, I'm in recovery myself and I've been through some uh, some what would be called not good rehabs. You know, the right. the resources were quite limited, the way that they uh, taught the model of addiction. eh, you know, it didn't really, I find, serve me it, to a certain right. extent, maybe. But uh, it seems like finally the tide is starting to change in some regards when we have yes. work like the book you're doing. Uh, a friend of mine, his name's Jameson, and he has this incredible rehab program. There's a few of them throughout the country called Newport Academy for teenagers. Oh, cool. And he has, similar to you, you know, they have the, the yoga instructors come in. They take a very holistic mind, body, spirit approach. There are horses there, therapeutic horses. Oh, great. Uh, things that I wish, you know, were available to me when I was going through it. But, you know, it is what it is. So. You know, I I love to see that you are doing this work, that this is available for people, because like you said, the success rates in certain areas are so low. But when you do take this holistic, integrative approach, as you said, 79.6, I believe, percent, that's incredible. Tremendous. It is. So uh, let's talk about, well, the book itself is broken down into 30 chapters in five phases, and readers are suggested to take a chapter a day. 
Um, and I appreciate how you and, and Dave uh, begin day one by recounting the Golden Buddha story. And mm -hmm. it's something you've previously written about in the Chicken Soup for the Soul book. But I would love if you could tell it here for, for the audience, sure. anyone who's not familiar with it. I think it's a great way to rely or relay to sobriety. Sure, sure. Well, in 1988, my wife and I were in Bangkok, Thailand. And um, we had gone over there to run some workshops for the government. And uh, we... Decided to be, you know stay for a couple of days, be tourists. And one of the things you do when you go to Bangkok is you visit normally three Buddhist temples, and you eat a lot of Thai food and you know the usual thing. Right. And so one of the temples we went to was called the Temple of the Golden Buddha, and there was a, a ten and a half foot tall, solid gold Buddha. I think the the price the, the value of it was like hundred and ninety six million dollars if you just <laughs> melted it down and made earrings out of it. Wow! And uh, it weighed two and a half tons. So, I mean, that's like 4,000, well, 5,000 pounds, you know? Yeah. And so no one's going to steal it because you'd have to come in with a crane. They'd notice it. But, <laughs> and it's beautiful. It's really a work of art. But when we were looking at it, off to one side, if, if the Buddha was here, there was a glass case. And there was a big piece of clay about that wide, about that tall, and about eight inches thick. And it was painted on the one side. And it said that in 1957, I think it was, they were moving this clay Buddha, they thought, to one side of Bangkok to the other because this temple where it was, they were making room for a highway to come in. So as they were lifting up this temple, or the uh, Buddha with a crane, it cracked. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're you're moving to David at the or the Pieta in the Vatican, something like that, and you <laughs> break it, you know? So they bring it back down to the ground and they covered it with a tarp because it was starting to rain and it wanted to get wet. Mm -hmm. That night, the head monk came out with a flashlight to see if it was staying dry. And when he shined under the tarp, he noticed in the crack a reflection of light. He said, well, wait, clay does not reflect light. What could be in there that's reflecting light? So the next day, with a little trepidation but a lot of curiosity, they took a chisel and in the back where if they made a mistake, it wouldn't show. Right. They started chipping away and lo and behold, discovered this golden Buddha. And the key word is discovered. They took the cover off of something that was already there. And so what happens is that my wife and I were looking at that and we were saying, wow, you know, well, what happened first, they think that 300 years earlier, the Burmese were attacking Thailand and in order to save this Buddha from being stolen as a spoil of war. They think what they did is they covered it with clay, mm -hmm. re-sculpted it, and then basically painted it so it looked like an old Buddha, a clay, a value, valueless. They think all the monks were massacred and so the secret died with the monks. And it was 300 years later that this was discovered. So my wife and I are having dinner that night, and she says to me, you know, that golden boot is a lot like the people we work with in our, in our workshops. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, basically, this golden essence, what do you want to call it, Christ consciousness, your soul, your Buddha nature, your spirit, um, the God within, any, any term you want for it. Right is the essence of who we are, but it's covered up with the clay of fear and self-doubt and shame and guilt and limiting beliefs. And the work is we don't have to pour anything into anybody. It's already there. Right. What we have to do is take off the limiting beliefs, the fear, the shame, all of that, such that the natural essence comes through. And I think how that relates to the work in recovery is that every one of us is a beautiful being inside. In fact, many of the people that I've but all my kids are artists and musicians. And so sensitive people often tend to get wounded more than insensitive people right. as children. And so they cover up to protect themselves. And then they numb out the pain of the rejection, the isolation, the guilt, whatever, uh, with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with gambling, with, you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so if we can just remove a lot of the pain and the guilt and the source, the wounding, if you will, and heal that, then the, the, the craving for these addictive substances and behaviors fall away. Yeah. It's not quite that simple, but it's much more simple than a lot of people think. A lot of people are trying to solve it through willpower. Yeah. You know, one day at a time, I just have to hold strong, call my sponsor, whatever. But what if you could get to a place where that need to drink disappeared? Yeah. And they didn't have to feel like it was an effort anymore, but it was just a natural way to be. Yeah. And that's the key. And, yeah. it, and it's a beautiful thing for those in recovery when they do start to experience that obsession that is lifted, um, right. you know, and that's so important. Um, 
And and I really love that story. Thanks for for sharing that. I was uh, I was being interviewed yesterday with a woman who has a program in Ireland, and she was talking about the shame culture over there that she surprised surrounds uh, those in recovery, AA, NA, whatever the case may be. It's mm-hmm. kind of a hush hush thing there. And she was just saying how it's so unfortunate because, as you were saying, you know, there's so much beauty within once we crack that clay you know these sensitive Mm -hmm. people some of the most absolute beautiful people i've ever met and had the pleasure of knowing are those who whether they're in recovery from drugs or alcohol are just wounded in some deep way but have come through it and their hearts are just you feel it when you're with them so it's really incredible when when you get to that place where you can get the clay off. well (laughs) it's interesting in ireland i've been to ireland a couple times i swear to god every fourth door on a main street's a (laughs) bar You know, it's just insane how much drinking goes on. I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's like there's these neighborhood bars. Most of them aren't. They're, they're as small as like two bedrooms in a house. Sure. And everybody gathers there. It's their social place. But the amount of alcoholism is in, it's, um, it's scary. So I'm glad that there's effective work being done over there. This is important. Yes, absolutely. And that segues pretty nicely into the next thing I want to ask you about. Can I ever drink again? This is something you discuss in the book. And mm-hmm. you say, you, you write in the book, the two of the most common questions that seem to come up in regards to this 30-day sobriety solution are one, can I ever drink again? And two, do I need to quit drinking right now? And I can say that I personally have tried moderation drinking and it's never ended well for me. No, and, and it's never <laughs> ended well for, for my youngest son either. Sure. <laughs> so let's That's talk what, about that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, you know, it, the truth is that I think for most people that are normally considered alcoholics, quote unquote, yeah. uh, drinking again is probably not a good idea and probably not going to happen. Right. We find that the people that go through this program in the last, uh, you know, Dave's been doing it for eight years. The book's been out just, you know, four months, I think. Right. And what happens is that most people will not be able to drink again. Uh, but if you tell them that in the beginning, they're not even going to pick up the book. Right. They're not going to go to AA. They're not going to go to rehab because they're scared to death Absolutely. that they're going to be miserable, in pain. They're not going to be able to deal with the emotions that come up when they don't drink. They're going to experience this anxiety in social situations. The big one is I'll never have fun again. Oh, you yeah. Know, all my funnest memories or when I was drinking, you know, whether it was spring break in Daytona beach or football games or whatever. Right. So the, the, the fact is if you tell people you can never drink again, many people won't even engage the program. But what happens by going through the program, most people get to the end and discover they don't even want to. And a, we've had a couple of people, you know, try and realize, Hmm, didn't work. Yeah. Got to you know, go back and not do that. And we've probably had five, sometimes 10% of the groups that we work with uh, can drink socially again because they weren't doing it from the same level, perhaps of the disease or the gene or whatever. Right. Uh, and they were just drinking too much. Yeah. You know, like a lot of kids go to college and they get into that fraternity, you know, binge drinking thing on the weekends, you know, where a lot of kids die of alcohol poisoning and so forth. And for some of these people, yeah, you know, they, they, they don't drink during the week. They don't have that obsession. They just, right. They're just they just drinking too much. Right. And so for them, cutting back is a real option. But for the person that we, you know, call the full-blown alcoholic, probably not so much. Yeah. But I think young people, especially my son who's 26, uh, we had to pull him out of college when he was a freshman, put him into a rehab program. Fortunately, did some good rehab, good therapy. And then me as a parent, we were able to bring all our resources to bear as well. And, you know, after a couple of years of sobriety, he thought, well, what, maybe I can. And he tried it and it, it <laughs> don't, that, you know, passed out again and went, guess I can't. You know? Right, right. But I think when you're young, you just have to test it one time, you know. Sure. I, and I tested it more than one time myself, you know, to be honest. But, you know, the thing is, it, it is so important that there is a difference between abuse and addiction. And so yes. I think, you know, that there is some people will pick up this book and be able to cut back. You know, if they have not crossed that line. Great. That's great. Right. Me, I cross. I was that guy. I had to drink first thing in the morning, every morning to calm the shakes, yeah. to stop yeah. the withdrawals. It was very, very bad. Um, yeah. So, yes, like you said, I know I wouldn't be the guy that could go back to it. I've tried. Doesn't work. But. It is important to note there is a big difference there. Well, just, just to give you a sense of this book, you know, we I originally wrote it with Dave to deal with people like yourself. And then what happened is our graphic designer for the book was reading it and she said, well, I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but I'm having two glasses of wine every night with dinner. Mm. We now know that two glasses of wine for a woman, if you do that five nights a week, it puts you at 70% greater risk for uh, breast cancer than people who wow. don't drink. 
<laughs> you know, the Alzheimer's, heart disease, kidney failure, you know, liver damage, all of that. So we've started this thing called the 30 day sobriety challenge for people that are not even necessarily alcoholics. Sure. If you can't go 30 days without a drink, you're definitely an alcoholic, <laughs> you know, but for those of us that can, uh, it's, it, it's, we call it like a 30 day reboot in the sense that what happens for you is, for her, she said, I'm just going to do what's in this book because I'm designing it. Why not try it? Yeah. And she was a fitness instructor, you know, it's a pretty healthy woman, but two glasses of wine every night, maybe three on a weekend. She said, I realized my, my evenings, I was always groggy. I was just, the best I could do was watch TV. I wasn't spending quality time with my kids. I wasn't spending quality time with my husband. I was waking up, not with a hangover, but just wasn't a hundred percent after 30 days. I realized, wow, this is what you're supposed to feel like. And so we're saying to anybody, even if you're just a social drinker, what if you could go 30 days and give your body a break? Mm. What we're all finding is when I did it, because I wanted to test the book along with everyone else, I lost weight. I felt clearer in the morning. I felt more motivated. I looked better. People commented on the fact that I didn't have little circles under my eyes, you know, I mean, and I wasn't drinking that much, you know, a couple of glasses of wine on the weekends. But I think that for anybody that wants to cut back, this is the way to do it. And if yeah. you want to quit totally, this is the way, you know, one of the ways to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing that I actually was not aware of this, uh, and you write about it, is this 30 days specifically. You, you share a very interesting story uh, that is based on an experiment that was conducted by NASA. Mm -hmm. And it demonstrates why it takes about 25 to 30 days to successfully reprogram the brain. So I would love for you to share a little bit more about sure. that. I know you just started talking a little bit about the reboot, but can right. you talk about what, what's happening in those 25 sure. to 30 days? Well, what happens is, is that NASA did an experiment where they had astronauts wear convex lens goggles for 30 days. Yeah. And you had to wear them at sleeping, showering, the whole thing. Because what it does, it makes your world appear upside down. Yeah. And they wanted to experiment with, can we put these guys in a gravityless environment like a space station, leave them up there for a month or two at a time? Are they going to lose their ability to sleep? Are they going to become angry? Will they lose their appetite? Will they get sick? You know, whatever. And they didn't want to put people in these, you know, things that cost billions of dollars if they weren't going to be able to handle it. What they found, which they weren't expecting, was that 25 to 30 days into the experiment, the astronauts' brains, even with the upside-down goggles, their brain turned the image right side up again. Mm -hmm. It was taking an upside-down image, and it was easier for the people to negotiate wow. reality by flipping it upside down, but it took 25 to 30 days to do that for the brain to re reprogram itself, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine you're trying to eat cereal and it looks like it's up there, <laughs> but it's really down there, and you're going, no, i got to, uh, you know, it's like, right. so anyway, what they came up with, the psychologist said, we call this the 30-day principle. And here's what's the important part. Yeah. What they did was half, the next group they did this with, they had half the astronauts take their goggles off on day 15. Don't put them on again until day 17. So 24 hours, no goggles. Mm -hmm. It took them another 25 to 30 days before the brain switched it. Miss one day, it's day you're starting. It's like an AA. Yeah. You can be sober for 10 years. You drink one night. The next day, if you're sober, you've been sober for one day. Yes, right. you know, and so it's the same thing with your brain. And so basically, anytime you want to create a new uh, belief, we know it's 25 to 30 days. New, however, a new a new habit. 66 days tends to be the sweet spot. Some research coming out of a school in London right now, just researching oh. beha behavior change. So, we recommend. Because a lot of people say, well, can you really get sober in 30 days? Well, as you know, you can do a lot in 30 days, sure. but you have to continue what you learn to do, whether it's meditation or breathing or visualization or affirmations or tapping or whatever. Continue to do that after that so that you maintain those disciplines, you will, whether it's eating well, doing yoga, like you said, you know, so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And and as with anything else, you do it long enough, it becomes like riding a bike for the most part. So that's right. that's a beautiful thing. Right. So there's another really interesting area of the book, uh, and I, I love this part. It's event plus response equals outcome. It's an equation that you use in there. And I, I want to share a brief excerpt from the book in which you write, Every outcome you experience in life, sobriety or alcoholism, excessive drinking or normal drinking, financial success or poverty, health or sickness, happiness or dissatisfaction, is the result of how you have responded to an earlier event or events in your life. The formula states that if you don't like the outcomes you're experiencing in your life today, you have two options. One, you can blame the event, or E, for your lack of results, which is O, 
Or two, you can change your responses, R, to the events, E, the way things are, until you get the outcomes, O, you want. So let's talk about that. I love that equation. It's a good one. Well, it really is true that basically yeah. everything you're currently experiencing are outcomes of how you responded to some earlier event in your life. Right. Somebody gives you a drink, that's the event, you drink it, that's the response, the outcome for you, not so good. Yeah. You know. So basically, in order to get the outcomes we want, what most of us do when we don't get them, let's start with that first, when we don't get the outcomes we want, instead of changing our response, which is required, think of a mathematical outcome or a formula, two plus two equals four. If you don't like four, if the universe is doing two, you've got to change your response from two to three mm -hmm. in order to get five. So what happens is most people, because changing our response is always uncomfortable, it's always awkward, it's always a little risky, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And so what happens is we rather blame the event. It's my father's fault. It's the economy's fault. It's the president's fault. Up where you live, it's the prime minister or the, you know, the, 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 the parliament's fault, right, whatever. Right, right. So basically we blame the weather. We blame the traffic. We blame that time of month. We blame our astrological sign. Anything to not take responsibility for it's our behavior that produces what we get, yeah. you know. So basically – it's a really simple formula that once you understand it, you can start to say, well, how am I currently creating my current reality? Mm -hmm. Because if I created it, I can change my response to the world and create something new. And there's only three responses we have any control over, Chris. One is, it is your thinking. So what is, what is, my, what is the story I'm telling myself? What are the beliefs I have? What is the, the excuses I'm making? You know, whatever in my head, we can change that. You know, stinking thinking, drinking thinking, you know, all those lies right. we tell ourselves, et cetera. The second thing you can change is your images, your your pictures of things. Like, you know, I say, we're going to stand up and dance now. And you go, cool, I'm a good dancer. Someone else goes, oh, shit, I got to go to the bathroom right now. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not good. I've, I had a bad experience with that in high school, you know, whatever. <laughs> same, in, same words, but different pictures in the mind create different outcomes of, like, fear or, or happiness. Right. And then the third thing is my behavior, which includes what I say and what I do. And so what happens is most people – that are alcoholics and other kind of addiction behaviors are doing blaming, complaining, and excuse making. Those are three big things they do. They've got to let, let go of and take responsibility, stop blaming other people, say, what am I doing to create this? One of my favorite exercises I do in my seminars with people is to say, uh, what's a difficult or troubling experience in my life? And so let's say it's, you know, I'm, I, I'm having trouble in my job, okay? How am I creating, promoting, or allowing that to happen? Well, I'm showing up late. I told him I would do something I really didn't want to do. I promised something that wasn't within my scope of ability to get done on time. You know, whatever. Right. Uh, what what's the payoff I get for keeping it like it is? Well, I get a lot of commiseration from my friends about how shitty the world is. I get to feel bad, but don't have to like, get another job because I can still blame and complain about this one. The other one will be more scary. What's the cost? Well, I'm miserable. I'm not happy. I'm drinking about it at night, whatever. Mm -hmm. What would I rather have? I'd rather have a job I enjoyed. What would have to happen for you to do that? Well, I'd have to like go out and get a new skill or go back to school or get some training or quit my job, you know, whatever. Okay. And the reality is, when will you do that? Well, most people go, oh, it's too scary. But if you do that, people realize I'm the one that's setting this up. Just to give you an example, I had a guy in a workshop once. I said, would you go see my brother in the hospital after the training? I said, sure. So he went over, he was going to have an operation. And I said, you know, that operation you need, I think it's caused by some emotional, mental stuff going on. I think we could heal that so you don't need the operation. The guy said, uh, I don't want you to do that. I said, why not? He said, I figured this is good for six weeks off work. <laughs> so he was willing to suffer wow. with a disease, possible, you know, iatrogenic hospital created illness, problems with, you know, the doctor's drunk and cuts a nerve, sure. problems with the anesthesiology being wrong, to get six weeks off work. So basically, we have a lot of things. When we were kids, if we were sick, think of it, it's a terrible situation. You're sick, but look at all the benefits you get when you're sick. You don't have to go to school. Yeah. You get to watch TV. You, usually there's some special diet. You're, you know, I, we always got ginger ale when I was sick. I love ginger yeah, ale. Yeah, me too. No, yep. no. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> no, I don't want to go to school. So there's payoffs for being sick. You know, yeah. so 
all of our negative experiences, we're getting some payoff that we don't want to look at instead of doing the risky hard thing to get the real payoff that we'd like to get, you know? Yeah, so well said. I'm laughing as you're saying that about school because I agree wholeheartedly until the one day I faked staying home sick and ended up getting chicken pox that day. Really, sincerely got chicken really pox. Really, really got sick. It really came back and bit me in the ass, but such yeah. is life sometimes. So. <laughs> That's funny. So... Another thing, let's let's talk about this because this is a big one. Why do you drink? Now, there's a very brief but important section of the book that explores why people drink. And I was so happy to see that it notes that alcohol or any other substance is just merely a symptom, whereas the real problem lies elsewhere. And that's Mm -hmm. something, you know, from my own experience, direct experience, as well as my own schooling and training, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, couldn't be more correct. So I would love for you to talk a bit about that. Well, basically, you know, our drinking, as we said, is a symptom of a deeper issue of trying to mask some emotion or some experience we don't want to feel, yeah. whether it's the anxiety of being in a social situation where we'd feel uncomfortable because we don't know what to say, we're afraid of rejection, uh, whether it's shame from something we did in the past. You know, I worked with a lot of young girls who, you know, had abortions, who were ashamed of that. Uh, I've worked with boys, you know, who stole money from their parents. And they were ashamed of that. The pain from divorce, you know, like yeah. my kids really, I got divorced when my, my children were very young and there's no question it had a negative impact on them. And so they felt, you know, unloved, unwanted, you know, a lot of things that came up out of that and those things needed to be healed. So we can drink, you know, as Gabor Mate says, uh, you know, the, the problem with addictions is they work. Yeah. Temporarily, (laughs) you know, they work for three or four hours, but the next morning you wake up, you still have the anxiety, you still have the pain, you still have the fear, the shame, the guilt, whatever. So until you handle that emotional wound, if you will, and learn how to cope with it and experience the feelings that are seemingly overwhelming uh, so you can manage them, release them, uh, express them safely in in ways that are where you're not going to die. I mean, I'm sure you've seen in rehab where someone says, if I start crying, I'll cry forever. If I get angry, I'll explode, you know? Well, I used to be a psychotherapist. I've never seen anyone cry forever. I've never seen anyone explode. And so it's a fear because it's so overwhelming and so huge that we want to numb it out, you know? And it's like saying that I have a fire um, alarm in my office Mm -hmm. and when it starts to go off, it really disturbs me. So I just go over and cut the wire. Yeah. Problem is there's still a fire, you know? And so basically... One of my favorite phrases I learned from a woman not too long ago who runs a rehab center in Texas, she said, skills, not pills. In other words, can we learn the skills to experience, manage, release, overcome, express, et cetera, uh, the feelings we have so that we don't have to mask them in order to, because we have to keep doing it. And as you know, and I know, your tolerance builds up. So you have to take more to get to the same level, whether it's a opiate or whether it's alcohol. Um, and then the, the toll on the body is insane. Yeah. And the toll on your life is insane. You know, um, nobody wants to be around someone who's throwing up in the backseat of their car every night. No, absolutely not. And, you know, in my own case, that was that was the big thing for me was, as you were just saying, you know, the expression, finding a way of working with what was going on, that wreckage of my past that was in there. Mm Because even though I would, you know, go through rehab and I would do some meetings, do the sponsorship thing, um, I was just doing enough, you know, to to get by. But I wasn't going inside and doing that work. And so inevitably that was still there. And I would always come back to the bottle because it just ended up becoming easier than dealing with the with the discomfort, the dis-ease that I was experiencing. So. Right. Yeah, I was being interviewed by a guy the other day, really cool guy, I liked him a lot. And um, and he's very been to AA, and that was totally his model until he saw my book and yeah. kind of, but he confronted me about some things and we were looking at that and I said, well, what's the issue for you? He says, well, without AA, I couldn't keep my demon under control. Hmm. And I said, you know, is it, have you ever considered it's possible that we could actually get the demon to move out? Mm. You know, because to him, he didn't know any of these new techniques that we've learned about EFT, about NLP, about all these different things we can do now. Yeah. Uh, Byron Katie's four questions. I mean, of course, so the work yeah. tools, uh, mm. that, that can be used. And he was really open to it, which I was excited and, to see. And, you know, originally I was concerned when we the subtitle of our book says, you know, how to cut back or quit drinking. And, you know, AA says you can't cut back, which you know, is right. basically true. Yeah. But the reality is that a lot of uh, people we've now met in rehab centers 
have said, you know, I probably turned a lot of people away. Maybe they even died because I wouldn't give them the, the bridge, that bridging time to say, well, maybe you could. Let's just start working on the demons inside. Because yeah. if it's just willpower, I use this metaphor. If you've got a boat and it's it's got an automatic pilot going north, and we can take the wheel of that boat and we can turn it to the right and overpower hmm. the, the automatic pilot and we go this way for a while. Yeah. But as soon as I let go of the wheel, the boat goes back north because the automatic pilot is programmed. Hmm. So your subconscious mind is the automatic pilot. Right. And your subconscious is running you. And willpower alone is not going to handle it. You know, willpower alone eventually gives up. And we have a whole chapter called will, uh, on willpower in the book. And here's an interesting thought. We discovered something called um, decision fatigue. And what happens is willpower fatigue. And so what happens in the morning, you have a lot of willpower. Now, in your case, you had to drink to get rid of the, the, the shakes in the morning. But if you're just a heavy drinker and you don't have the full-blown addiction built into the system yet, uh, you know, you could say, well, I'm not going to have a Bloody Mary. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to be fine. But then as the day goes on, your willpower goes down. Yeah. They first discovered this with uh, parole boards where they found they had compassion fatigue. In the morning, 70% of all people who come and see the parole officers in the morning in the prisons, they get parole. In the afternoon, 10%. They're so tired of making decisions. They just said, no, 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 no. So if you're ever in prison, go in the morning. But anyway, what, what we know is by the time happy hour rolls around and someone says, you want to go for a drink? It's, yeah, why not? You know. Yeah. So basically, we've got to go in and reprogram that automatic pilot and release the emotional trauma and the emotional pain so that it's not running you anymore and once that's gone then that demon is no longer there it's not running you right you know what's interesting is as i read that section you were just talking about in the book though i could not relate with drugs or alcohol another substance i've struggled with is food and that mm -hmm. came up for me it's like just like you just said in the morning i'm not going to do it today no problem i've got this by the end of the night and i would do good for most of the day but by the end of the night you know that that piece of cake or whatever it might be was you know looking extra good and more times right. than not i would i would falter and, and eat it and you have a section and i apologize i didn't make a note on this but it kind of goes hand in hand with it was the hundred percent um correct me if i'm wrong you talk about i'm not going to do it today there's no 90 percent um Right. If you could, well, 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 we have a phrase called a hundred, a hundred percent of breeze, ninety nine percent of bitch. That's it. Exa okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I always say, would you like to be married to someone who's ninety nine percent committed to monogamy? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like you never right. know. It's today the day that one percent. You know. Right. And according to that, three three point six five days out of the year, you need to be worried. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to be waking up every morning having to recalibrate that decision not to drink every day again. Yes. You know, you really want to get to the point where it just doesn't occur to you. You yeah. know, I mean, it, it never occurs to me to drink hydrochloric acid, you know, just go drink sulfuric acid or something. I mean, yeah. I'd be stupid to do that. Right. And you really have to get to a place for someone who's an alcoholic where it just it wouldn't appeal to you anymore, any more yeah. than that would. Right. But you're right. The, the willpower goes down during the day. And my for my wife, it's cupcakes, you know, she's pretty much got it handled, but we'll go out to dinner and we go past the dessert little, you know, thing. She goes, Oh my God, look at that cupcake. <laughs> it's like, if you ever heard Jim Gaffigan do his riff on food? I have, I know who he is, but I have not yeah, heard it. Yeah. He's got a thing on, on food where he goes, hello, cookie. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a sexual seduction. Oh moment. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. It, you know, you, you, we say the people in the program make a commitment for 30 days yeah. not to drink. Yes. You know, at the end of that 30 days, if you want to test it, go ahead. You'll see if you can do that or not. As I tell you, most people can't. But make that 100% commitment for these 30 days. Most people, Chris, and you know this, have never made a 100% commitment to anything. Sure. You know, they've always wanted that out. Well, I wasn't really trying. You know, if I really wanted it, I could have. Because – when you make a 100% commitment, then if it doesn't work out, like there's this huge disappointment you're going to experience. Yeah. However, when you do make that 100% commitment, it's no longer a choice. It's called I do it no matter what. Then life actually is easier because yes, you're not yeah. struggling with that decision every day. Yeah. And with my times in, in sobriety recovery, I noticed that when you get to that point, 100%, it's not going to happen. It it does. It becomes easier and it just becomes your way of life. Like I said earlier, like riding a bike. So mm -hmm. I really appreciated that section of the book. Uh, now, there's two more things I want to talk to you about before we wrap this up. And I should just note for the audience, we've talked about a lot, 
But this is barely even scratching the surface of everything mm. you cover in this book. It's, what is it, like 400 pages, I think? Over yeah, there's a lot there. Over 500. It's it's a great, great read. But the thing is not to let the size it overwhelm you because each chapter is like maybe 20 pages long. Right. And like you say, a chapter, what is it, a day? A day. A day. Or, so it's, you know, we tell people, look, you can do this one chapter a day. Yes. If you're more comfortable doing one chapter every two days or yeah. one chapter every three days, that's fine. Yeah. As long as you have a rhythm and you're committed to that rhythm so you don't like start going all over the place with it yeah i'm glad you make that note because to me i i get excited about 500 page books i'm a big book nerd but that's not everyone is and i forget that so well said a good point uh and it is easily digestible and very reader friendly too which i think is is very important when you're discussing such important Thank topics you. like this yeah so let's talk about the importance of action there was a very interesting statistic that you shared in this regarding the percentage of information we retain after two weeks time and how mm -hmm. it depends on the various ways in which we take it in. So reading came in last at only 10% and next we had hearing at 20%, then mm -hmm. seeing at 30% and a combination of seeing and hearing at 50%. And those are the passive ways of retaining information according to the cone learning chart that you shared. Right. And then there's the active part of the chart, which consists of what you say and write equaling 70% retention of what we remember learning after two weeks time. And then the coup de gras is the 90% retention as a result of what we say and do, which exemplifies the importance of taking action. Right. I love that chart. So let's talk about this, the importance of taking action. Well, we learn by doing, you know, yeah. like, like you, you mentioned riding a bike. Yeah. You can't learn to ride a bike by watching movies about it. You can't learn to ride a bike by having a motivational speaker who's got an Olympic gold medal in bicycling come in. Um, even if it was someone who was taking drugs like Lance Armstrong, <laughs> yes, <laughs> just yes. doing a thing on the side. <laughs> but literally, you know, you can be motivated, inspired and see people teaching. You've got to get on the bike yeah. and you've got to get that balance and get that sense of momentum going. And after you do that, then... You know, some people that are listening to this and watching this haven't been on a bike in 30 years. Yeah. But you get on a bike and you know how to ride it because it's in your muscle memory. And so muscle memory is where we want to get to where it's just you know how to do it. You know, the first time you cook a recipe, you're looking at the instructions in the book and maybe the first three or four times. And after a while, you don't need the recipe anymore. And so it's the doing of it that helps you do it. And, and something that's not in that chart, <clears throat> which is a, you want to get 100 percent, is teach it. Yeah. You know, if, if you teach something, you're going to have to confront everything you don't understand about it. You're going to ask questions by your audience, which will also help you maybe get clear where you don't know. You're going to go back and learn it. But the basic thing is when you do it, you, it becomes real for you. That's why this program is an action program. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to read this book. If you're just going to read it, I wouldn't even buy it. Right. If yeah. you're going to do it, then it's a, it's a workbook, if you will, that takes you through a program. This program, when it was a, a coaching program, was of about $2,000 to go through. Mm. So because we have a companion website that's free, that has everything the coaching program had in it, videos of EFT tapping, guided visualizations and meditations you can do. There's a chat room. There's a place where you can, you know, chat with other people going through the program. Dave and I go in and we do Q&A with people on the, on, on the site and so forth. Um, you're getting a $2,000 program in a $18 book if you buy it from Amazon, 28 if you buy it in a bookstore, right. maybe a few more if you buy it in Canada because of the exchange rate. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> but trust me, it's less than a good bottle of wine. So Yes, it is. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> The reality is it'll change your life. But the the idea is you've got to do the activity. So that's why we have journal writing. That's why we have meditations. That's why we have reflections. Um, just for example, the values, uh, the core values day where you go through your values and figure out, well, what are your values and rank order your top five. And then we look at how are those values being compromised by your drinking? You, integrity might be one of your values, but you find yourself lying to your wife about the fact you went to the bar that night or you're hiding your alcohol, you know, in the garage, you know, uh, you, you, one of your values might be taking care of your kids, but you didn't have the money to buy them the soccer shoes because you bought everyone around of drinks at the bar that right. night, you know. So the, the reality is every one of those things, you have to do it in order to get the aha, the insight, the yeah. breakthrough, the awareness. Yeah. And then once you do, it Velcros into the system. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. And the last thing I wanted to talk with you about was the power of vision. And it's one of the themes of the book, which is how to get from where you are to where you want to be, 
or knowing where you are today versus where you want to be in the future and mm-hmm. the importance of creating a vision and detailed description around that. And I think that's so important because I know in my own case and many other people I, that I've worked with that are in recovery, especially the early stages, they're so overwhelmed. You know, they're just their life's just barely getting back on track. Some of them have court dates. You know, some of them have just been in the hospital, the emergency room. And as they start to get that period of sobriety, whether it's, you know, a week, 30 days into 60, 90 days, mm-hmm. you know, they're still a lot of people are just kind of, you know, treading water. Mm-hmm. So it's it is so important to create this vision, you know, recognize where you are today, but understand where do you want to be? And and I think that can be very tricky for, for people early on in recovery. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Well, the first, you know, in the first couple of days when we open up the vision, we don't look at the vision of your life after sobriety. Mm-hmm. We just look at what's your vision of you 30 days from now look like. Sure. Yeah. So we really start with like, you know, don't try to take on too much yeah. in the beginning. You know, just focus. Like a lot of people go, well, I want to focus on being sober, losing weight, you know, getting a better job. You know, no, don't do that. Yeah. You know, focus on getting sober. And so once we get to the latter part of the program, like day 27 or 28, then we can create a vision of what it would look like in your life out in the world being sober. You know, maybe you want to be an artist. Maybe you want to have your own restaurant. Maybe you want to have a band. Maybe, you, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. But don't jump the gun. But here's the problem. Your brain works like a GPS system in a car. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a destination, you get buffeted by everything around you. We know that girls who have goals, in like high school girls in inner city schools who have goals, when they set goals in their freshman or sophomore year, they are 80% less likely to get pregnant in school than girls who don't have goals for after high school Mm -hmm. because they see the pregnancy as something that's going to get in the way of their goals. And so you have to have a sense of where am I trying to get to? What 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 do I want to be experiencing? Well, maybe in the beginning, I just want to be experiencing being clear-headed. I want to experience not feeling guilty. I want to experience, you know, not having this craving like I'm going to die. I don't want to I don't want to be experiencing this detox tremors, whatever it might be. But then after you get through that, you can go to the next place. Like, you know, I have a in the movie The Secret, I, I give this example of driving a car through the night. When you're driving a car, you have to be able to see ahead where the road is or you're going to drive off the road. That's why we turn the headlights on. Right. However, our headlights only go about 300 meters if they go that far. Now, I can't see past that. But if I drive that 300 meters, guess what happens? As I drive, the next 300 meters shows up. Right. So we don't need to see that much further in the beginning. But once we get to the place where like now you're 30, 90 days sober, as you're saying, coming out of rehab or doing this program, now we can look at what is your sober life look like? We call it thriving in sobriety. Yeah. Most people focus on not drinking. And if you go to AA, they talk about not drinking. Don't drink. What's the next drink? Don't, you know, the focus is on drinking. And again, I have nothing against AA. AA has been sure. really helpful for my kids yeah. and a lot of people. But if you don't have a vision of what it looks like to be sober, we know the subconscious mind. If I say, don't think of elephants, what image comes up in your mind? An elephant. But if I say, think of roses, what image comes up in your mind? Roses. But not elephants. Not elephants, right. So if I don't want you to think of elephants, I want you to have a vision of something else that you're, you're, draw, you're going towards. So we, we program this GPS system by putting in an image. Yeah. The GPS thinks in pictures. Yeah. And so we have to have an image. And this is the problem with a lot of people setting goals. They do it with words, but it never becomes a picture. Mm, yeah. The picture is really powerful. Yeah. Well, it the book itself, as I've already said, it's a great read. I love that it's another resource I can add to my own list. You know, when I do my own workshops or speak at mm-hmm. conferences, I'm often asked, what what program should I do? What do you recommend? And I the only thing I advocate for is for an individual to find what works for them. Whether right. it's AA, whether it's NA, whether it's Noah Levine's Refuge Recovery, the new 30-day sobriety, well, new to the public in book form, 30-day sobriety solution, mm-hmm. integral recovery. There's a lot of different programs out there. And I think this right. is a tremendous one to add amongst that list. So, you know, I thank you for bringing this into the world with Dave Andrews. And again, just to reiterate, we talked about a lot there's so much more in the book. Is there anything I didn't cover that you would like to add or leave the audience with? Well, I would just say, you know, if, if, if at all this feels attractive to you, you know, go to amazon.ca or amazon.com, yeah. barnesandnoble.com, 
get a copy of the book. It, it really is, it, it's so simple to do these every day. Mm-hmm. There's stuff on forgiveness, stuff on tapping, stuff on affirmations, visualization, uh, overcoming our willpower problems, you know, on and on and on. And each day it's simple to do. It doesn't take more than an hour. And at the end of 30 days, as one of the uh, five-star reviews on Amazon said, I bought this to get over my addiction, which I feel like I've done. But what I really didn't realize, I was buying a self-help program, like a, a week-long workshop, you know, eight hours a day in a book. And he said, my whole life is different. You know, I really view everything differently now. I feel like I have unlimited potential to, you know, make a meaningful contribution through my work and my life that I didn't see before. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. so we'll we'll have the links up for uh, w- with this, so people can sh- simply click on it, or like you said, just go ahead Good. to Amazon, type it in. Um, I have to tell you one more thing before we go. You are the doppelganger for my 26 year old son, Christopher. <laughs> Christopher. Am I right? Field. Yeah, same name. He looks like you. He's got the big ear uh, ring holes <laughs> in his ear. He's got the same facial structure, the same voice. Really? I'm going to have him look at one of your uh, podcasts. He's going to blow him away. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, well, I'll send uh, Veronica, your assistant, this when we're done. Okay. And you can send it on over. That's so funny. Well, yeah. it's nice to we've talked once before over the phone, never uh, in person. So, well, it's nice to connect with you and, and see you. Yeah, you too. All right, Jack. Well, again, thank you for this book. Thank you for the time. And uh, thank you for the work you're doing in the world. Appreciate it. Well, my pleasure for the platform, Chris, and keep doing the good work you're doing as well. Take care, my friend. Be well. You too. Bye.